information before I stop, talk here rather than there. Can you hear me in the back of the room? Okay. So when you can't hear me in the back of the room, raise your hand. And I think I'm going to be on YouTube or something. Can you hear me? <laughs> okay. Got it. Um, so I know a few people in the room, but I don't know the majority. So the question when I pose myself, what do we know, what do we not know, depends in part, what have you heard before? Mm -hmm. So just as a kind of a poll, how many people have ever heard of mycobacterium paratuberculosis? Raise your hands. Okay. And how many of you got all your information from that finely distilled source of data called Google? <laughs> um, and uh, how many of you have wanted to try antibiotics against mycobacteria? Okay. So there we are. So we have an idea out there that some people have tried to pursue by looking at Google, and a smaller subset of people are trying to address with antibiotics. And what I want to do today is tell you where I believe we are at a crossroads. And I want to talk to you about some things that we know that I think are established. Now, am I standing right in between somebody's eyesight and my presentation? So if I go over here, well, what I guess I have to do is come over and hit it. There's no remote, is that right? Okay, but at least now you can see the slide. Okay, I'll try to do that. What do we know? Where I feel we're comfortable, you know what? And what are the things that are ideas? They're not facts. To me, ideas then are what I consider testable hypotheses. They're the starting point for an experiment. They are not the conclusion, okay? So, to think of what we do and what we don't know, I'm somewhat inspired by the election in the United States. <laughs> where we have all learned, and I stole this shamelessly from Google, from the great poet Donald Rumsfeld, <laughs> that there are no knowns. These are things we know that we know. There are known unknowns. That is to say, there are things that we know we don't know. And there are also unknown unknowns. There are things we don't know we don't know. <laughs> Yes, I, I don't actually know if he invented this, but he used this when talking about yellow cake and the acquisition of uranium and intelligence. So, my objective today, briefly, I want to tell you what I think are known knowns. I want to inform you about what I call known unknowns. And by the end of the talk, I want to give at least two examples of what I consider unknown unknowns where I hear things and I step back and I say, I don't know if the premise of the question is right, nor do I know if the research is right. These are just unknowns to me, and we shouldn't say yes or no based on things <coughs> that are too many unknowns in the same sentence. And, and you all learned somewhere in high school or university that in multiple choice exams, if there were two negatives in the sentence, you just crossed it out because you could never really figure out what it meant. <laughs> so. As an overview, what I'd like to talk about is the following things. I want to start, unfortunately it's bland, but I think we need a definition. So that if I'm talking about a bacteria called Mycobacterium avium paratuberculosis, we all have to know what am I talking about? How is it defined? And what is it what it isn't? I want to tell you a couple of knowns. I want to tell you a little bit about what is a fact. What we know this organism causes in cows and livestock, and I want to know what little bit we know about what has been found when looking for this organism in humans. And I want to tell you about some important unknowns. One is the cause of disease, and the other is can we cure Crohn's disease by giving antibiotics directed against that bacteria. And then I want to leave you with concluding thoughts, and hopefully there'll be enough time for questions comments, uh, other ideas, and ways forward. Okay, so the simple definition, as bland and Linnaean and taxonomic as this sounds, we all are homo sapiens and that's our name and that's who we are. So we have to say mycobacterium is a genus. Just like Escherichia is a genus, or Salmonella, or Bifidobacteria, that's a genus. Mycobacterium avium is a species. That thing, Escherichia, you've never heard about is actually a part of E. coli. You've all heard of E. coli. <coughs> e. coli is a species just like Mycobacterium avium is a species. 
Why was this bacteria called avium? Because it was isolated from a sick chicken. This was originally the bacteria that caused tuberculosis in poultry in the late 1800s. Okay? We're not talking about sick chickens today. <laughs> like the bacterium avium paratuberculosis, that's a subspecies. That's when you got that extra name at the end. So MAP is equivalent at the sort of taxonomical level, like talking about E. coli O157. We don't talk about Walkerton having had a problem with E. coli. It had a problem with E. coli O157. That's the thing that causes hamburger disease and is quite distinct from all the other E. coli. We just heard in the last talk that there are E. coli that are being marketed as being good for you. So you wouldn't want to mix the thing that's good for you with the thing that was in the water in Walkerton. So I'm talking about a subspecies, and I want to tell you a little about what we know about that subspecies of bacteria. So I'm obviously very specific. I'm not giving you generalities. That's what I study. Okay. So how can you contrast mycobacterium avium versus this thing? It's like asking, how is E. coli different from E. coli 157? Okay. Mycobacterium avium is the name for bacteria that are all over the environment. There's probably some M. avium in my water glass right there. It's in the water, it's in the soil. These are organisms that typically are of low virulence. They generally do not make people sick. We encountered them in medicine when Mark and I were training, when people with very severe immune suppression, like AIDS, had disseminated disease due to disseminated mycobacterium avium. But if your immune system is not that sick, humans generally do not get invasive disease with these organisms. These are what you would call benign organisms. So they're just out there. This organism, when you read about it on Google, people say mycobacterium avian paratuberculosis is a ubiquitous environmental organism that causes Crohn's disease. No, it isn't. It is not an environmental organism. Okay. The bacteria, if you were to look on the planet and ask, where are the bacteria? They're in the sick cows. They're in the cows that they made sick. And they are of increased virulence. Cows are constantly eating and drinking these things, amadium, and not getting sick from them. But when cows have these things, they get sick. And these cattle do not have AIDS. They are not cattle that have had major uh, immune suppressive drugs or major immune suppressive viruses. So this is an organism that can cause disease in a host that is not that sick. That means it must have its own inherent virulence to be able to cause disease. Okay? It's not borrowing the host to cause disease. Okay. So why does that matter? If you do a family tree of mycobacterium avium using genetics, and this is something that is cut off at the bottom, apparently Karen had the same thing, that the, the, the little messages were cut off. This is a genetic tree, and you could imagine saying, well, here are all the primates, and those are humans coming out of there. Or you could say, here are all the uh, peaches, and these are nectarines coming there. It's a branch of organisms that comes out of a larger cluster of organisms. Mycobacterium avium is all those things. They're highly variable. They're in the soil. They're in the water. When I talk about mycobacterium avium paratuberculosis, I'm talking about this very distinct separate branch of organisms. And what our lab is trying to do, and we are slowly getting towards it, is we're trying to ask what happened on the route from this thing to that thing. We have cataloged all the extra genes that have been inserted that are found only in these bacteria and are not found in the environmentals. But now we have to do the heavy lifting, which is trying to find out what those extra genes do and how those extra genes have led a harmless organism to become a pathogenic organism. This is a common motif in all of bacteriology. Everything that you've heard causes human disease. There's a relative that was actually relatively harmless and it acquired something along the line, whether it's Salmonella, or Bordetella, or all these other organisms. So that's one thing our lab is trying to do. So now you know we're talking about mycobacterium avium paratuberculosis. I want to just emphasize again the idea that this is a pathogenic organism. One way you can look at it is pragmatically. If you are a farmer and your herd is sick, how can you deal with it? 